and I want to urge each country today to start talking about respectful maternity care. Respectful maternity care starts from the time the woman is, has conceived, from the time this woman is going through antenatal, from the time this woman is going through labor and delivery up to postnatal. So each country should start today, start orienting everyone who is in contact with a woman to start talking about respect to maternity care. It should be a maid, a cleaner, a, be it a nurse, be it a doctor, everyone should be talking about respect to maternity care. A woman has the right to have a child and to have a child in the right environment and with quality care. So today I'm urging every nation, including Croatia, let's not just talk about let's not just talk about breaking the silence, but acting by ensuring that everybody is talking about respect to maternity care. These are things that are happening everywhere, including Africa. And today we are advocating for respectful maternity care everywhere. Be it a man, starting from the husband, the time that your wife is pregnant, start respecting her because she needs to go through respect for maternity care and she deserves to have the right to have a child in a very good environment and without pain. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, there is an announcement uh, today in the evening, there is a, in the afternoon, there is a workshop on the gender and women's health. So please, uh, you can discuss there, the who want to uh, have some point there. Now, the shortage of the time. I conclude this uh, supplementary. Thanks and thanks and thanks. One thing that help for all. Now, health for all. Now, we can help another way. Now, for health. Now. now, thank you very much. You feel you don't want to be in appear in the pictures. Your mind want to show up, but but as so many of you are already doing a lot of pictures around the days, I think this shouldn't be of much concern. But I just wanted to name it. And uh, another on another point, oh, this is uh, my second colleague Zönke, our regional project coordinator for South Asian region. So for any questions regarding medical and its work in South Asia, please contact Zönke. Not me, I'm the, I'm the, health, the Global Health Project Coordinator with the PHM. Um, yeah. So this is uh, what I would do. I, I would also like to ask you to, oh, oh, what I want to do is while moderating this session is that I, I, I am very attached to a strict gender equity policy, so I, I will have a look that uh, it's a very gender balanced discussion. So if, uh, if the men will feel that they might not come in the order of their appearance, uh, this has, might have something to do with this. But uh, I think I rest assured and we are not too many people so that we will have enough space for it. Yeah, and, and luckily we have a microphone, so I think it's good. We tried. I, I, I would say we tried. You maybe it. try without the microphone. Can you just speak without the microphone and see if it, because the sound is not that good. The sound is not that good, so we can try it. No, we don't have long to yes, the sound. Huh? Yeah, without a microphone. Yeah, it's very small. Do you think without? The microphone yeah. is also without working. I did get it. Yeah. 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 Um, say your name, your affiliation, and um, yeah, what brings you to the community that you are working with. But only, let's say, one sentence each, so that we manage to do it in five minutes. Where do you want to start? Do you want to start? Yeah. Would you want to start? Okay. I am Alicia Trujillo. I come from Brazil. And we have a big... Uh, Health workers, whether they take part in the campaign of the 
Roman Vega, I come from Colombia and I am a professor at the university and we also work with health workers in communities, especially in the workers. My name is Hanta, I am from India, I am a My name is Hanta and I am an elder community Hello everyone, I'm Janak Thapa from Nepal. I'm working in Nepal for the Amazon Program Thank you. Oh, my name is Zama, I'm from South Africa. Uh, we work in organizing and fighting for lives for Nepal. I am Dr. Shaukat Arman, working in Mono Vishwamitra. Uh, member of the team. I'm going to say a community worker also in outreach, dealing with all the problems of the community, multi-sectoral from EHM. Okay. I'm Dr. Kadir from Bangladesh. I'm working with TK, a public health activist and also very much involved with the construction of health program. <laughs> I am uh, Dr. Mizan Rahman, working with Manchester Gangro uh, at Shabar Hospital <coughs> and also at the uh, field level. I'm working. And Marco Fernandez from Brazil, uh, Sac Palace, a uh, member of the Landless Movement, uh, and also Via uh, Campesina, where they moved to be. Hi everyone, I'm Tindai Mokuma from Southern Italy. Afternoon, I'm Tindai Mokuma from Southern Italy. I work for People's Health Movement in South Africa and the Code Group. Thank you. I'm Thank you. 
great mix of people from different countries, different continents and experience. So I hope this will inspire our discussion very much. So I maybe now yes. we start with the presentation. So I, I would like to call into the Stage. Uh, my name is Tinashe Njai. I'm uh, sorry, I couldn't introduce myself already. <laughs> I'm the coordinator of the People's Health Movement. Um, we thank you for joining us in this workshop. Um, before we start, I just want to have an idea as to what comes into your way when you hear the word South Africa. Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela, yes. Something else? Urban Gym. Sorry? Urban Gym. I'm in gym. Just pop up, don't worry. Sorry? Upper day, yes. Something else? I said something else? TAC, power of food. Those from South Africa again also. Sorry. Rain Foundation. thank you. Those from South Africa can also tell us what comes to your mind. Sorry? Football. 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 Okay. When you hear South Africa, you're from South Africa. Robin Island. Thank you. Something else? Boxing. Boxing. What comes to mind? Beautiful country. It's home. It's home. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi. Okay, okay, okay. I thought, I thought you'd also, it's, it's good that you're, poor, yeah, 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 you're mentioning the positives that we have, but uh, the reality is that South Africa, we might be talking about these nice things, Rainbow Nation, Robin Island, Cape Town, Table Mountain, but South Africa is not immune to what is happening into the rest of the world. We are in what we call a health crisis right now in, 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 in South Africa. Uh, uh, most of our people in South Africa have got a population of 56 million. Out of that 56 million, most of them lives in townships. Most of them lives in uh, rural areas, farms, and uh, where there's no proper service. They lack sanitation, they lack um, adequate uh, services from from being provided, including houses and all that. So uh, we are a, a middle-income earning country, yes. But sorry, we are we are a, a, a middle-income earning country. But what we get out of our health is not what's the wealth of the country. So we are getting less against what the country is. Um, are we we are. Our, our health indicators are lower than Bangladesh, lower than Uganda, I mean lower than Ghana, lower than Rwanda, which are some of the countries which are poorer than South Africa, but they've got higher health indicators. Um, we've got a massive uh, burden, quite a poor burden of diseases, mainly HIV, TB, and uh, other infectious diseases. We also have got uh, uh, high maternal child uh, mortality. We also have got lots of uh, lots of accidents, violence, and injuries. Uh, Non-communicable non diseases as well are uh, also killing a lot of people these days. Many diabetes, cancer, uh, and so forth. Uh, South Africa is an amicable. Society. I'm, I'm, uh, this is now where I'm, where I'm coming from. But well, well, now I'm saying, I can give you an example of Cape Town. Cape Town, the other side of the mountain, is so nice, beautiful. You see the Jorobil Island, you see the Sea Point, the Kenfrey, and so forth. But you go to the other side of the mountain where what they call Cape Flats is, it's totally different. There's a lot of informal settlements, as I've said. Um, so we are a team of women organizations. Five organizations that uh, that is funded by uh, Medical International, and um, we all work in uh, commun 
we work with community healthcare workers in different aspects. Uh, this I've said that uh, South Africa is one of the most unequal societies. So if you want to know more about South Africa, as my, my, my colleagues present, they will tell you more about, I mean, with their presentation, I'm sure you don't have another clear picture, uh, another side of, of, of South Africa besides the cricket, the football, and so forth. Right. So I'm going to call upon Tendai to tell us about it. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I don't, am I in the way? Can everyone see me or should I sit? Or you can try to sit. I can move the slides for you. No, it's not. Okay, so I've introduced myself already. Um, I'm not going to speak much to this slide. I've got a poster on the wall behind that just says what, what my organization does. We're called Section 27. So if you want more information on that, you can look at the poster. Um, basically what I'm going to do this afternoon is briefly tell you about the health system and the situation in South Africa and just elaborate a little bit more on what Tinashe just said. Um, so we all know that health is a non deliverable right. We all agree on that. And I'm so glad someone, well, glad is probably the wrong way, but I'm really glad that someone in the back mentioned apartheid. Um, how many of you guys here know about apartheid? Apartheid? So, so basically it was a system of um, segregation and discrimination, right? So between 1948 and 1994, there was racial discrimination against black people in South Africa. And this resulted in the health of black people being affected significantly. Uh, black people were living in conditions that caused ill health. We were all talking about SDGs earlier. So, you know, the social determinants of health for black people were really terrible at the time, and even now they still exist. Um, there was segregation of health services. So there were hospitals that were specifically for white people and hospitals that were for black people. And I don't think I have to explain if there was any difference between the facilities. Obviously, the white people had really great facilities and good doctors and up-to-date technology. And I cannot say the same for black people. Um, and there was also unequal spending on health services. So more money from the budget would be allocated towards a very small population, which was the white people. Um, and the impact of this segregation and everything that I've mentioned earlier was that there were high rates of infectious diseases um, and infectious and transmissible diseases such as TB, STIs, as well as also high rates of disease of poverty amongst black people. Fast forward to 1994, we have a democratic um, government that inherited an unequal health, an unequal health system. These inequalities included geographical differences in the distribution of healthcare services, um, also the quality of healthcare in the public, so you have public health and private health system, and obviously there are differences between the quality of healthcare in those systems, um, and also still unsafe and safe living conditions that obviously impact um, health, health of people. And so with that on the one hand, we also have a new constitution. This new constitution guarantees everyone in South Africa the right to equality, which is now different from the system before, where people could be treated differently. Um, and also entitles everyone to the right to dignity. Um, this constitution also places an obligation on the state and also on private parties to respect, to protect, to promote, and to fulfill the rights that are written in the Constitution that are given to everyone. So I've mentioned two rights so far, equality and dignity. And the other right that it gives, that the Constitution gives to everyone is the right to access to healthcare services. And this is written in Section 27 of the Constitution, which is where the name of my organization comes from. So basically, Section 27 of the Constitution says, Everyone, uh, it deals with health care, food, water, and social security. And it says that everyone has the right to access to health care services, which includes reproductive health um, care. Everyone has the right to sufficient food, water, and um, social security if they are able to support themselves. It also says that the state must take every um, reasonable measure to make sure that those rights that are uh, given, that I just mentioned, are accessible to everyone and they are fulfilled. It also says that no one may be refused emergency health treatment. 
So what the constitution does is that it places positive duties and negative duties yeah. on, on, on parties. This, the, what the constitution does is it places positive and negative duties on the state and also on private, private bodies, private people. Um, so with that in mind, we have to think about what are the, does it mean that everyone can walk into a hospital and get the best health care services? Is there anyone who wants to say yes? If the constitution says you have the right to access health care services, does it mean you can just, when you walk into a hospital, first, does it mean you can just walk into a hospital very easily? No. Does it mean that when you actually make it to the hospital, there will be a doctor waiting to help you? No. Right? So, so you have a constitution that promises you all those rights, but whether they actually exist on the ground is a different problem, is a different situation. So there are so many challenges to the healthcare system, like Tinashe was mentioning earlier. There are issues of infra infrastructure and medical supplies. Most of our hospitals and clinics are very old. They haven't been maintained or renovated. Um, we don't have appropriate ambulances. Some of the areas are quite hilly, so there are a lot of mountains, and people live on those mountains, but we don't have ambulances that are able to go up to the top and bring someone down to the hospital, so that's a problem. Um, we also have issues with medical supplies, so there are always concerns of um, stockouts, quite recently we had stock, uh, stockouts of medicines, for air, we had stockouts of ARVs, we had stockouts of contraceptives. Um, across the country. <coughs> and these are these issues of medical supplies and stockouts uh, can be attributed to different things, you know. Um, intellectual property issues, but also just the supply management chain not being managed properly. So the government not pay um, the people that they have given tenders to provide services. So that's the first issue. The second issue that um, is human resources. So a lot of doctors quantify in the migrate to greener pastures to get a countries where they will have like, better lives. Um, that's the first thing, but also unequal distribution of doctors and nurses and, you know, no one wants to go to the rural areas where you don't have great Wi-Fi. Um, and there's also, <laughs> there's also a prevalence of HIV and AIDS, and there's also TB and um, uh, STIs. Like Tinashe mentioned, um, there are quite severe issues with mother child health, so quite um, high mortality there. And also with non-communicable diseases, particularly cancer and diabetes. So those are such huge issues. And then we still have a two-tiered system. So we have the private health and we have public health. So public health is government funded. Uh, oh, first, the, the systems are divided along socioeconomic lines. Um, which also, to some extent, which also is influenced by race. Um, so in the public health, we have government funding, and it is open to. I know my slides say all the citizens of South Africa, but everyone in South Africa can get um, healthcare services from a public health health facility. The services are free, uh, but there are disadvantages with that. These disadvantages include long waiting times. So people have to wait very long before they are attended to by a nurse or by a doctor. Also, the appointments are very rushed because they need to attend to as many people as possible. Like I said earlier, the facilities are old and the equipment is dated. Um, so those are the big issues that we experience in the public health sector. Um, some migrants also face big difficulties when they try to access um, health services. Even though the constitution says everyone in South Africa, it doesn't say only the citizens, you will find that when migrants try to get to get health care services in the hospitals, they are asked for their passport, they ask for all this documentation that is actually not required. The second one is a private health system where people opt to purchase private insurance in order to be treated in private hospitals and health clinics. So what that means is shorter waiting times, you can make an appointment on your phone and go to a doctor and you are attended to quickly. Uh, appointments are not rushed and also you have bed facilities. But the unfortunate reality is that only the employed and better off. So it's not all the employed, it's only the employed and those who are better off can afford access to private health care services. Um, the premiums are very high, not everyone can afford them. And between 14 and 16 percent of the population can actually afford to go to a private health care facility. So the question becomes, who serves the poor? And this is what this, this workshop is mostly about, community health care workers. 
because these are really the foot soldiers that are in the disadvantaged communities who are working door to door, bringing services to, to people who can't um, get to hospitals or who cannot afford to go to a hospital. And also just promoting um, healthy living, health promotion. So with this, I'm going to... Oh, I think I have another slide. Okay. Um, having said that, there's also been a, a lot of legislative, regulatory and policy changes to just ensure that um, there is everyone in the country can benefit from quality and affordable, uh, quality, affordable and accessible health, health services. These have included um, setting up an office of the health standards compliance. This is basically like a, an ombudsman who is responsible to make sure that facilities comply with the norms and standards to make sure that everything, yeah, so there's a norms and standards. Um, they've also embarked on a primary health care in the area that I think someone will talk about. Um, there's also a test and treat policy, so the moment you test that you're HIV positive, then you go on to ARVs. Um, so we've also been talking about the national health insurance, which is our, uh, which is the proposed model for bringing universal health care coverage in South Africa. There's also been a health, care, a health market inquiry that has tried to find out what exactly is going on in the private sector to see whether people are not being charged too much for their premiums and whether the packages that they are being given are actually um, worth their money and yeah, yeah, all those things. Um, and a recent policy that is very applicable to this workshop is the World Award Based Primary Health Care Outreach Team Strategy and Policy Document. And that basically speaks to the work of community health care workers. And with that, I think I can finally pass on to the next person. And I think that person is better. Thank you.
So you had a large degree of migrant labor because um, people were healthy, but cheap labor was with the double mines. Where people lived, they didn't really need money. But the government wanted people to move to the mines, so they implemented what is called the hut tax. So now men had to leave and go to the mines so that they could pay the hut tax, otherwise they wouldn't be forced off their land. Which meant that they lost skilled farmers, agriculture became poorer than what it was before, soil erosion, low food production, leading to malnutrition, poverty, mental health issues, and infectious diseases. So, they based their services on that. And the first lot of community health workers at Polelo, also that trust in KZN, um, had a broad view of health, not just the, um, the healthcare, Western healthcare system. And um, they worked in an intersectoral way, using education, agriculture. But then came 1948 and the apartheid system, which then created the homelands and we now had 14 departments of health. One for each homeland within South Africa, one for Indians, one for colors, one for whites. Yeah, so we were totally fragmented. And you can imagine all of these systems with their administrations and everything and how that took the money away from where it should go to administrative systems. So, in the 1980s, Although South Africa was um, not allowed to attend the Alba Art Declaration, others that were progressive health workers in those days got, the, got to hear about what the Alba Art Declaration was about. And so started developing community health workers, looking at um, them as agents of change. Also looking at it comprehensively with intersectoral collaboration and community participation. And this was led largely by an organization called the National Progressive Primary Health Care Network, um, where there were lots of conferences and networking with all different community health workers around the country. Post-1994, um, money was sent from the donors that had originally um, supported the progressive non-governmental organizations to the state. And in some provinces, money was withheld for at least five years. So most of those services didn't really drop because the community health workers, even without pay, carried on doing what they were doing previously. Um, but then you came the AIDS epidemic and the focus changed from that broad comprehensive approach to very much home-based care, selective care of HIV, TB, um, maternal and child health, so a lot of siloed programs. Um, and, and the community health workers in that context, because they were now mostly being paid a lot through the state and that were becoming um, arms and legs of the state rather than from the community and accountable to the community because now the role had changed slightly. So more recently, we are hoping and still fighting that with the um, National Health Insurance and the new engineering of primary health care, and I think someone else is going to talk more about that, um, there's a move more towards comprehensive role of um, looking at the social, de de social determinants of health. And also the hope for the future is the self-organizing, which has gone on. I just want to go back to the previous slide, where you can see in Gauteng province, um, community work, health workers fighting, and I think I will probably speak a lot to that. Um, and um, it now gives us another chance to really bring in collective, I mean, comprehensive primary health care. Now, from the point of view of um, the people's health movement, we run the South African People's Health Assembly. Uh, health, sorry, South African People's Health University, aimed mainly at community health workers, where the new policy is looking at the role 
as, look, as working with the social determinants of health, but not actually bringing that training into the programs. So we have started doing that, and Tanash, you're going to just mention Okay, the so we, about. Yeah, so, so, I mean, the subway itself is mainly explained on the, on the poster there, but then it is a short course that we started in 2013 after being inspired by people's, yeah, International People's Health University, which was hosted in Cape Town in 2012. So, in this course, we train community health workers we, on issues of political economics of health, uh, social determinants, so sexual and reproductive health, and so forth. Uh, but most of the information is on the poster. I'm also happy to see you, to, to, to talk to you and go through them and explain why we, we, we train them in that way. Thank you. Amanda, how are you, how are you too? Amanda. Uh, oh, what is happening in South Africa is a, it's been a, a very tough war between uh, the Indian Health workers and South African Department of Health. Uh, in many situations, uh, in this time, we still find ourselves that uh, the Department of Health in South Africa refuses to recognize CHWs as part of the health system. And one of the big wars that has been happening between us and the department was that they must fix the thing. They must integrate CHWs, they must be under the National Department of Health. But what has happened in, in this war for the past 10 years is that CHWs even today in South Africa find themselves in precarious conditions. Most of them can work this year and next year they are out of work. And, and this is a very, very huge uh, problem because when the CHWs try to raise questions around their conditions of work, when they try to help the health department, and to assist in the well-being of the patients in, 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 in the very poor conditions they, they are threatened with unfair dismissals, they are taken down, they are never listened to. So one of the big challenges now in Perving and we're fighting and we're trying to mobilize and, and work under is that get the care workers to be integrated, to be solidified, to be fixed so that we know how we're working and how can we then deepen and strengthen they are their work. So that's one of the major challenges that we're having in, in South Africa. And I say that when I spoke around the lack of integration. Uh, in South Africa currently, we can say that uh, community care workers do not necessarily work for the Department of Health. They're not like nurses. They're not like uh, doctors. We don't know where they are. It's, it's, a, it's a very uh, typical confusion. And I'll talk more about when we had a case uh, with them, where they can change CHWs around. They say, no, they're not employed by us, but they're employed by NGOs, but they're not employed by NGOs, they're employed by labor brokers. So it's a huge thing that the Southern government still refuses to recognize CHWs as uh, important for primary health care. They do speak of them as nicely, they write about them in their policy document, but they will never formalize them and give them straight work for them to do their work properly. So those, those are the major challenges. Uh, we still have a lot of cases, at least in, in us in Johannesburg, on uh, very unsafe working conditions. Uh, a lot of CHWs, as they move from house to house, households, they get bitten by dogs, they get raped by the men in the violent townships, and, and those things go nowhere. Because one, they don't, have, they don't have labor rights. So if they get injured at work while going to heal the patients, they, they they have to see how they deal with themselves. And these are the major problems because now CHW can't do their work in optimal conditions. Some of these CHW, mind you, they sacrifice their time and go to patients at night. You know, and go to the houses and assist and, and do great work in very dangerous conditions. Just to say, South Africa is a very unequal society in the world and uh, half of the population in South Africa lives in poverty. A uh, quarter of the population in South Africa lives in dire poverty. So there's an upscale in, 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 in violence in the townships, in the slums. There's a, South Africa has the highest uh, rates of abuse against women, considering that uh, CHWs, most of them, 90% in our case, are women. So this unsafe condition is a really, really, really challenge. That a lot of CHWs 
some of them decide not to go to work. It's just too traumatizing because at the end of the day, you get bitten, you get raped, that's your issue. We, we don't care. And because of the passion that the CSWs want and then the drive that they want to help the communities, they keep on going in those dangerous and very unsafe conditions. Uh, other things, we, CSWs in our country just work without any protective care. They have no class, they have no nothing to protect themselves. They just go in their bare hands and they have to deal with all the other diseases that they extract from the patients. So these are the one, one of the major demands that we, we're fighting against now, which the National Department of Health doesn't want to fix. Uh, in South Africa, we have, as Tendai said, we have like 56 million people. Uh, we, because of the unfair dismissals, uh, the number of CHWs has gone down drastically. We now estimate that we probably have 70,000 CHWs to, to serve uh, 56 million people. But uh, a research has been done uh, by doctors in South Africa that said South Africa to be able to handle the burden of disease in our country you need approximately 400,000 CSWs. So we we carrying that heavy disease in, in the country in only 70,000. So you can imagine how many people in the country, poor people in the country don't have access to primary health care because the department refuses to hire more CSWs. Actually the plan of the department is to cut CSWs down into half. So even the 70,000 that we have now, we might not have next year, which is another struggle that is upon our hands now. We, where we based in Joba, we used to have 9,000 CSWs, and they were cut down to 8,000 something. We're not sure, because the bloodbath of unfair dismissal, of telling them to go home, of not recognizing the importance, leave the patients in very dark conditions. We don't know, we don't even, really, really understand that all those who were taken out, whether their patients are getting care or not. And that's how bad things are, are, are becoming in, um, in, in South Africa. We, CSWs don't have standardized or formal education in South Africa. They, there's no accredited system where we know that we can go and improve their skills, where we know that CSWs are introduced to new medicines, that CSWs are know the new techniques, and they're given new gadgets as our system, health system is also changing. There's no that kind of thing. They sort of work with experience and what they see as they go to house from house. And I think that's a problem because now as new diseases come by, you need a very updated CHW that can be able to, to handle the disease that they find in the street. So we, we have these major, major challenges in the country and we, we, we're struggling, we're mobilizing for us to target and make sure that these, at least these uh, five or six things are fixed. Then we can then say we have a group of CHWs that is cons consistent, that can work, that can go into communities and work in a right manner. We, I mean, a lot of uh, research has been done on this, on uh, interviews and, uh, and petitions on what's happening to CSWs of uh, problems at work and 90% of the CSWs still today they will tell you that they have problems with work because firstly they are not consulted they are not formally part of the health system that's basically what's happening in Africa and we try to force the department to recognize them for them to be part of the system so these are the major challenges and as I said before we don't know who employs CSWs in, in the country formally Sometimes the department, sometimes the NGO, sometimes labor brokers. It's just a mess. Uh, as I said, there's a huge struggle that we have done uh, over over ten years now of, of us self-organizing CHWs into forums, into organizations, into unions, for them to struggle for recognition, to be recognized as health workers, as important as they are to the South African population. Uh, I have a few copies of this book sort of that you compile of the struggles that they went through. You can see inside the pictures as well, it's uh, the marches that we had, the mass meetings that we had, the CHWs, the launches of the forum. It just details more what has happened over the past 10 years on, of struggling to be recognized by the department, of struggling to be seen and to be consulted and to be part of the health system and to be part of the broader 
uh, society and agents in the community for change. And I think we, we have a few copies we'll, we'll distribute. You will just, it just, it has a chronology of events, where it started, how the CHW started coming together and trying to struggle, where do we go from there? We opened multiple cases at the Human Rights Commission. We opened multiple cases in, in the Court of Law of South Africa. So it, it details, it's a long, long, long struggle where we find ourselves in. And I think she also has some newsletters that we distribute uh, that are read in the clinics of the community health care workers. And that's how we sort of communicate with them when we have a mass meeting or a strike, or we're trying to sort of organize some sort of demonstration. So that we at least try to force the Department of Health to do some of the things that we want to do. It's been tough. Most of the things have not been done, but we, we continue to to try and. Uh, uh, I mean, in South Africa, CHWs are not even part of the minimum wage of the country. Uh, the president of the country has students for CHWs. They are seriously underpaid. Most of them barely make ends meet. Uh, they, some of them, uh, because of the levels of poverty in South Africa, some of them spend most of their money p uh, buying the patient's food because it's dangerous to just give the patient medicine and they haven't eaten. So there's a, there's a lot of struggles within there that we fighting for the CHW to be recognized and also to get better pay for them to do their work. So it's, it's a very difficult struggle and still a challenge. But yeah, we, that's where we are with the challenges and where we're still trying to... I'll come back and sort of give you where we are and where are we going in the, in the next few slides. I'll, I'll just let my colleagues now come in. Thanks.
community health workers are self-organized and community health care workers are self-organized to connect to each other because we know there is safety in numbers. So if they speak in one big voice, it, it might be more effective than individuals you know, saying their concerns. And at the larger level, which is uh, community health care workers policy development and, and community health care workers voice are heard and improved working conditions as Zama has already mentioned what are the dire situations they were under. Network project activities. Also at the individual level is to see that district support group with psychosocial support and at the next level it's community leadership training and organization are strengthened and the development of provincial health care workers forum and networking are exist and also do what are they supposed to do in terms of what are they mandated. At the next level is policy submission and mass campaigns, uh, public marches, media campaigns, uh, sit-ins at the minister, minister's office and national networking of community health care workers in general where they mobilize themselves and discuss issues affecting them. Then what are the challenges of the Community Health Care Workers Network project? Although the project has been doing very well and they have achieved a lot, but there were some challenges that have been experienced. Community Health Care Workers are still work as volunteers. Already, Zama has already mentioned that they are not recognized as employees. So as a result, they are not getting a reasonable salaries, but they are getting stipends. In general, many community health care workers are easily influenced. You know, they are being swayed. It's either by the, <coughs> the government or by at the district level, at the national level, with those endless promises, or else uh, the what you call the structures they, where they pay money for unions, labor unions. They are exploited by labor unions. You find that uh, one community health care worker. <coughs> has joined about five labor unions and they are all taking money that was already little and not enough. When community health care workers are too out, when they are too outspoken, especially when they complain about or they challenge the financial corruption, they are being threatened, they are being victimized. As well, some of the things that happen, it's worse as much as they are being arrested or they lose their job. So there's one particular case that has been handled by Section 27 where child care workers were, were arrested. So Section 27 has to come in and make sure that the arrest record are cleared. NGO partners have very different strategies and approaches from, like there are five organizations which are, which are very diverse in terms of strategies that they use in terms of working with community health care workers. They range from those who, who, who provide psychosocial support and those who do political education, mass action, as well as legal advocacy, which at, some, at times, you know, creates a little bit of conflict because, you know, they have diverse skills and the approach is, is diverse. Like I said, there's been a lot of successes with regards to, to, to the network. One few of the successes is there's been an increase in community health care workers self-organization at all levels. It could be local level, provincial and national level, which, which has enabled them to, 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 to have collect, collect, collective actions and also their voice is more heard as they are more I mean, of a structure now rather than individual or smaller groups. There has been an increase in political education and leadership of community health care workers' awareness of labor rights. So they've been capacitated, so now they know their rights, they know what to do when they encounter problems, or they know the correct routes to follow. There has been also an increase in community health care workers' national public visibility. So there has been a quote from one of the activists from Treatment Action Complaints, who, who has made a comment about, he said, previously community health care workers were very divided and now they are united. That was said by Patrick Mundetti. So as a continuation of success, um, recent national standardization increase in community health care workers. As we speak, we are receiving endless call from community health care workers because the, that previously we find that different Different group and different 
and different um, provinces are getting different stipends. One will get 1,900 in terms of rents and the others will get 2,000 rents. So recently that has been standardized. So everyone is going to get 3.5, which is still not I mean, a salary that you live on, but at least there is no quarrels in terms of who's getting what and why they're getting what they're getting. There's been challenge, challenges to policies on issues pertaining to community health care workers. That helps help because they're able to challenge as a big group without being victimized, challenging policies. The different NGO, the different NGO partners bring very different expertise. Uh, so as much as it has, it's, a, it's a challenge because of diverse ideologies, but it also serves as a resource because everyone brings their expertise in terms of resolving the challenges faced by community health care workers. There has been an increase in community health care workers' commitment and concern for the well-being of their patients, where some has said that an increase in community health care worker organizing might make them more self-oriented. So also, as a benefit, now that the program is more structured, the people that they are looking after, the reason for their existence, and there has also been a lot of improvement because now they are more focused on the whole, on the reason for their existence. You know, there is more work that is done at the community level, and there is more work that is done also at the at, at the individual level because there is a lot of household, you know, as Nzamo has mentioned, to work with her individual patient. Thank you. Sir. Oh, sorry, sorry. Just quickly, um, we, I don't know why my slide is here, um, I come from a social justice institution in South Africa called Kanye College. Uh, what Kanye College does is to try and uh, bring uh, working class constituencies who have suffered from, you know, globalized capitalism and uh, struggles against neoliberalism in South Africa. Uh, what we do with uh, various programs, um, the first program that we started with uh, years back is uh, what we call the Josie Book Fair. Josie meaning uh, Johannesburg. What the uh, Johannesburg Book Fair it does is that it goes around schools and uh, poor schools in, in our region and it sort of uh, advocates for the culture of reading and writing. In South Africa, it's South Africa is one of the major uh, illiterate countries. Uh, our 10 year olds can't read and write. And we try to counteract that uh, uh, failure from the department where kids who are 10 years old that can't read, can't interpret what they are reading. And that's one of the programs that we do. We run a, a legal aid sort of office of uh, poor people who can't afford a legal course. In South Africa, it's very expensive uh, for you, especially uh, accident survivors who want to come and claim their money. Uh, they mostly come to us and we help them with legal services. Uh, we also then have a social movement program. And I think uh, my, my colleague here will talk about uh, how we are working with them as a forum of community health care workers into uh, what we do. In the social movement, uh, sort of uh, section is that uh, uh, Kanye College is known as the house of movements in South Africa. So a lot of movements that are coming with uh, occupiers of land, whether it's health as well, working with community health care workers, whether it's farm workers, they all come and meet. So we have a huge building where all movements, especially those who don't have infrastructure and they are currently fighting the government or fighting any neoliberal policies, they come and meet at Kanye College. And this is the space that then opens to them uh, for workshops, it opens for them for education, and all other things. Uh, yeah, but now we have decided as a college to strengthen the community health care project because of how we think community health care workers are agents of change and because they are strategically in the communities. So we can change working class conditions through them. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. 
which has helped us a lot in how to organize ourselves. In 2010, where we started, it was only lay counselors. Lay counselors were those who were working inside the clinic, not those who are working out. And then we we walk along from 2010, 2012, being typical to how to organize because people doesn't have that mind of political thing and you have to give them political uh, education so that they can hear what you're saying to fight for your own rights. And your Kanya, we, then Kanya said, no, Kanya police said, no, we cannot do it for you, but we can help you do it. So we, are, we come to uh, those to organize each other, uh, ourselves, uh, according to our hotel community clinics that around we have two two clinics which are four hundred clinics, Westland, Hotel, Westland, um, Sibay, Ebule, those regions inside inside Hotel we have uh, two members of these clinics that are community members and and the uh, office members who implement five people which are um, one of them in the office for us and then in local team level we have uh, other communities there is an external police that will uh, give the message or the thought for the regional meetings at the community level. So um, we, we, we then come to 2016 where a uh, community like us now it's, all, it's now enough. We had enough like pregnant and abuse for us. And uh, not being recognized as whether we were, as Sama has just said, whether we are volunteers, we wanted to know our status, whether we are volunteers, uh, whether we are a service provider so that we can know who we are actually. Then we come together and say, Kanya, this is us. Can you please help and then they help, as Sama has just said, about the legal issues and then help us with that legal issues then. Um, on the, on the 2016 March, we got an award saying that we are employees of the department. But the Department of Health ignored it. Instead, they uh, give another contract to a, a broker. Uh, the, 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 the operation was for them to pay us, but then we said, we just uh, I saw some other community members. Some were told we are old enough, we cannot work anymore. Some didn't have the things. Whereas our previous MEC said, everyone's part. Because we are doing, we don't, we, even if we don't have a trade, as they are now coming to say, in, come get, uh, next year they say, those who have all the trades. And then as a uh, forum, we say, everyone who have been working, working, as a community health worker from the NGO, as we have been absorbed from the NGO, different NGOs to be employees of the Department of Health. So everyone has, is equal to everyone who has done As um, she, she just mentioned that about the 2.5, we also fight for that that it must not be given as a resolution. Resolution 1 of 2018 has been signed on June that says people must, those, those who are really receiving 2.5 will be all the plans. As for um, how do we need for workers for them? We fight and they say no, uh, or because they've been doing this job and uh, they were less than 30 when they started. Now they are about 50, and then uh, they are about 50, but they are less than 60 for uh, pension. So everyone must get it, although it's only one year course, which it was signed on June and it's going to end uh, June next year. So. With, um, with the help of uh, Kanya College, uh, House of Women, uh, we just walk uh, slowly, but at least that is the life where we are going to fight for our rights. And then that we know that everyone has the right to cry and to be heard. And then the Department, Department of Health is now starting to hear what this time when they are doing this, we are there. We did give it much. Uh, to legislature, we say in the book outside there. Uh, we did much uh, to the Department of Health offices, sit in there, demanding that the uh, MEC should be here. Even yesterday, some of them were there, uh, 
saying to the MEC, no, you must implement uh, this, uh, this award that we just recently received the second one which we will receive on the 28th of September this year. Uh, that's what all what we have uh, from as a community with challenges and with a lot of challenges we demand to be in the service of Department of Health. And then we know that we are going to cross that bridge. Whether he like it, she like it or not, as I did MEC. And I hope you two uh, people's help <coughs> and how people are still like, uh, struggling to find who are they, where for, what, because the other countries are just waiting for free. I think you are a right leader in your health. We are doing this with uh, passion. But uh, at the end of the day, maybe somebody must say thank you. Because this is a state thing. It's not us. It's not for us as individuals. Even if I love it, we, uh, to care for us, I might need that one day. That is why I'm saying to you, even, even uh, those other countries that are still trying, that is still the hope that say, March and five federal human rights, uh, with the help of some others, we get help from other people as we did, as Tanya has just uh, in, uh, get married to us that says, I'll work with you along this path. And thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank, you. thank you very much. Now we have really uh, used almost uh, all of our time up for the first part of our workshop. But I uh, think it was an excellent, an excellent, excellent uh, presentation of a complex situation in South Africa with so many groups involved. And uh, this is what was the inspiring part of it why Mexico also decided to focus on this example rather than using all the other experience in the room to present. So I hope we can now interact for the last 15 minutes as a start of the discussion that we would like to, uh, to continue after the, after the tea break. Um, about your experience also, uh, what, what are ways of how to strengthen community after work is in their work? What, what examples are, what is working, maybe what is not working, or what are the challenges that you see in this kind of work, as we also have put out down a few questions if you wouldn't want to discuss, but please also show up and then uh, we just start and, uh, and yeah. Um, What I'd love to hear, for example, 
example from the South Africans is what are community health workers doing? You know, from I mean it could range from from curative to preventative and promotive and how are they representing community leaders? So 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 what are they doing now? What could they be doing more of? And what support do they need in order to do more of what they are not able at this time to do? So thank you. Uh, just, just to explain, I, I was for 15 weeks of so we have until 4.30, so 45 minutes, so uh, you don't rush. No, 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 then we have tea break. <laughs>
extra money for is is sort of guided by what is what is incentivized. So agendas are very much top down. Um, monitoring uh, the, the kind of data that they gather, the kind of uh, monitoring of services that happens is largely is the uh, um, the way that the monitoring is kind of structured is more is the community doing this, doing that, as opposed to is this is the health service providing this, providing that, um, and therefore the the monitoring is also very much top, top down as the accountability. Um, also, because they are contractual, they become soft targets. So any any kind of um, uh, activism that that any sort of complaints against the system um, result in them being the first ones to be sacked. Uh, so they become the softest targets uh, for any kind of uh, um, yeah um, complaints by anyone. So, so in some senses, and they were ironically conceptualized under the Community Action for Health agenda of the uh, government of India, where where they said, okay, we want. We want a system where uh, communities take charge, communities monitor health systems and uh, these ASHA workers, the auxiliary uh, social health activists as they are called, uh, were uh, conceptualized as a part of this framework of, of sort of community action for health. And, uh, and so I think again to go back to your idea of whether they are uh, from the community or the government, uh, they are very much kind of accountable to the government. Are, uh, insecure, made insecure by the government, um, and so the idea of the, the, the community actually get, I, I mean, them becoming uh, sensitive about their own community's needs for health become very secondary to the job that they're doing, um, and so that that is always at loggerheads. They also also find themselves extremely alienated because they're neither the community, they're kind of strolled off by the community all the time that they are not supporting them, not not advocating for them. And they are also told off by the government as oh, you are not doing enough, uh, maternal mortality is at, at an all time high, children are still malnourished, blah, blah, blah. your fault. So uh, they are extremely alienated and so in that alienated context it becomes very difficult to politicize, to collectivize, to come together. Um, and so I mean I am again re reiterating the problem but trying to maybe articulate it in more uh, concrete terms. Um, and so. Um, what we're trying to do, and maybe this might have some idea on what, what, how to think about this problem, is uh, is trying to. We work with women's collectives in uh, in in parts of extremely marginalized pockets of rural Gujarat uh, with uh, vulnerable community, with a vulnerable occupation, um, and in these pockets, especially because they're extremely remote, access to health services is really bad for extremely marginalized populations. What we try, to, what, what we're doing is we're working with these women's collectives. Uh, that are completely local, and they have health activists that, have, that they have recognized in each of these villages. So, in some senses, we're trying to create this duplicate duplication system, but which which kind of uh, provides a model of what may be thought of as different in terms of how do community health workers uh, become more from the community rather than from from the government. And these health workers, sort of every month, uh, uh, the indicators for what is good health are decided in participatory ways with the community. Uh, on these indicators, they prepare <coughs> reports every month and are shared with the community every month. Um, and so in some senses there is an accountability to the community and then they together are able to collectivize, uh, mobilize and hold the health system to account uh, for, for what, what, what goes wrong. Of course this is something that is very difficult to scale up because the government is never going to buy into the idea of the community actually uh, monitoring its health services. So that's where we are at Thanks. Thank you very much. I, I heard about this Asha experience. Yeah, of course. The, 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 there was one. Maybe. I'm sorry, I couldn't join the session. I've been the past time, attendees as an organizer. I did not want to make any meeting and just come back.
before the public term. But this uh, term of community health worker now in Bangladesh is a thing. In government sector in Bangladesh, in this day, there is no position in this day in the government health system. In the government health system, there is a uh, in the government clinic is there for 6,000 population and one person with three month training, trained with some basic medicine and some treatment, they sit there just to treat some cases and give it some medicine. They have very little relation and very little scope to work with the community and interaction with the community is a mean, we are meeting with the CSW. The other post of this government health system, the health assistant, they are mostly dealing with the community diseases, immunization and some health education and others. And in the family planning sector, the family planning assistant and some family planning visitors is there, who are mostly dealing with the pregnant mother, family planning materials and others. So, we have been saying that community worker, community health worker, we have been, it, it has been told before that traditional birth attendance and their history of traditional birth attendance in Bangladesh since began, but in 1995, the government declared that as they are traditional, they do not have any formal education, so they stop this. They are harmful for the society, not for the society, they are harmful for the existence. Rather, Improving the maternal mortality and infant, they are, they are doing hard for this. So in 1995, the government stopped this project. But some of the organizations in Bangladesh, like BD, BRAG, Bangladesh, we still believe, and there is proof, that this traditional part that we if trained in some basic things for the community, and they can improve the scenario, because this community health work or a traditional part of it, they are not a clinician. They are much touched with the society, giving some skill and knowledge with some basic services for pregnant mother and some other babies, but with a touch with the community, with the feelings with the community. But now, this traditional part of it is also rejected from the government services. We are few organizations, beyond the current, against the current, we are working with this traditional part of it. And in our working area, also in Ubinik area, that we have been proved in our health system that even with this traditional birth attendance, with a very minimum, minimum cost, you can even reduce the maternal amounts infant mortality in, in your service area. It has been proved because we are also dealing every year almost 15,000 normal deliveries in our working area. We have all the information, all the data with that. And it is said that there is Nothing is statistically significant different between the traditional bar attendant handling with the deliveries and the delivery handling with the clinicians or the trained midwife in the hospital. And the propaganda is the advertisement is this, please bring all the deliveries to the centers. But the center is not there. So this is the trade end. Trade is going on in Bangladesh. How, how we, we, we want to against the current we are, how we will move. But it's, it's still, we believe that this type of community health worker is very much needed for the society. Otherwise, this is another strategy of the private sector. Because now this traditional birth attendant and CSW event for the government family planning worker, they have been purchased, something like that, by the private sector. How? The traditional birth attendant, a normal delivery, even she can deliver at home with the assistant of some paramedic and other. But they are not now doing this at home. They are willing to refer it to the in a private clinic. Because the agent of the private clinic, in such a way they are motivating or demotivating this traditional birth attendant. If she delivered the baby at home, Maybe the house owner will give some incentives or a small amount of money. But if they refer this case to the private clinic, they will give 1000 or 2000. So this lady, a poor, so poor woman is thinking, if I put this pregnant mother to the clinic, that clinic, they will give me 2000. If I deliver that home, maybe I do not receive anything because it is a responsibility of the social 
So this is another thing for, for this community health work in, in, in our in Bangladesh. And we are every time we are encouraging the institution delivery in the name of institution delivery. Our paraprofessional, rather we are destroying our paraprofessional, I would say something like that. And so in the government system there was limited scope in Bangladesh, only in the private sector, we have some paraprofessional still practicing one of the others that we are carrying. Again, the education to be a paramedic in government institution you need to have a science background. 10th class with science background. Otherwise, you cannot admit in a para paramedical institution, either it is government or government approved private. But there is many para paramedics who want to be a paramedic and what kind of community health worker who has not science background. But they are very much involved. So this is another obstacle that if you want to be a paramedic in the public system, they cannot be if they are not a science background. And if we, even we are training them, giving the training, but we are giving their own certificate, it is not a government approved certificate. So they are not coming because they will not visit the government job. So in this situation, it is really plain in Bangladesh how we move with this community health worker in this against the country. This is just a concern in, in, in our context here in Bangladesh. Sorry, I I let me take a layer on that. So I think it's very good to see that. For well, host country, about uh, the debates that there is some question on the Philippines. Yes, um, so you, you talk of that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so I'm Yumi uh, from the Philippines. So first, uh, I congratulate. Uh, I can feel the hardship and the overwhelming commitment of our comrade from South Africa. So uh, maybe uh, what I we can add is uh, the key factor in. Uh, setting up a community uh, health uh, workers is uh, first is to set up the people's organization. People's organization will choose who among the community members will be, become community health workers. Community health workers will be chosen because they are the one respected in the community, either they are the youth, the mother, the health leaders, or the leaders. Since they are living in the community, the people's organization will protect these community health workers. So in our uh, experience in the community, in the Philippines, community health workers are protected by the community itself because they were there. They are the ones who protected the community. They are the agents of change, as explained very well by our community <coughs> and uh, everybody here. So uh, I think uh, uh, which we should, uh, the very important factor for us uh, community health workers to last long and uh, multiply, uh, set up the people's organization. And then the people's organization will take good care of the education. Our community health leaders uh, don't uh, have any stipend, unlike in our uh, comrade in uh, South Africa. Because uh, in the beginning, our community health workers are trained uh, we gave them training on social, economic, political conditions. Uh, the Philippines is so rich in natural resources, from the sea, ocean, mountains, but we are very poor. Why? Because only few uh, got all these resources. 